This is the uh, European History Lecture for Wednesday, the 5th of January, 2022. And what you have just gotten is the list of case study topics for your second semester case study. Now, you will see there are two sides. There are 119 settled topics that cover everything from the Congress of Vienna all the way up through the present moment. Now, the closer we get to the contemporary moment, the less it's history, the more it is political science or politics. The less easy it is to get anything objective, the more that you're going to get biased sources of one kind or another. So bear that in mind as you look for topics. Also, you will want to, uh, if there is a deep interest that you have that's not listed here, tomorrow when we choose these things, it won't be today, come in with a suggestion, pitch it to me, I will think about it. If I like it, I'll find a way to make it work. If I don't like it, then you'll do something else. If I were you, I would come in with three or four options. Each of you is going to get your own unique one. I've got two classes of Euro. I've got 119, so everyone's going to do their own. You're not going to have any parallels in other classes. So, um, questions? Yeah. Can we give you a picture now? No. Tomorrow. It's like, it's uh, no, because I'm going to have negative reactions just because you're not listening to me. And you won't, bless you, you won't get it. It's like reverse psychology. It's like if you tell everyone not to smoke, there'll, there'll be people who will just light up for that purpose. So uh, look these over. And are there other questions? Yet. Good. Please close the shades and turn off the lights. Hey everybody, it's music time. What time? You'll see. Okay, subtext of what we just saw is yes, there are poor people. Boo hoo. Oh, it's sad. Um, that is from Les Miserables, Broadway production turned into a movie. Um, and what you saw there is a workhouse for women. And you saw rows upon rows of workstations where each woman has a job. Now, understand, there's an emotional reaction that people have to the Industrial Revolution. From our comfortable 21st century perch, where we have high technology and uh, accessories, appliances, to do so much of the grunt work. It's horrific. It just looks wrong. It looks cruel, dirty, <coughs> ramshackle. And the normal reaction of a sane, nice person is, oh my God, they actually lived like that? Well, that's where historical context comes in. What we're about to cover is the irrepressible change of a revolution like no other. This revolution is akin more to the mastery of fire and the development of agriculture than it is to anything we have covered so far since. Because this industrial revolution, which begins in Britain in the late 1700s and uh, reaches its peak in the mid-19th century, in the mid-1800s, is a revolution not in our politics or our philosophy or even our faith. It's a revolution in the way that we make things, in the way that we produce what we need to live. So, in some respects, this industrial revolution is going to involve more intimate change to a person's daily routine than even the Parisians experienced during the French Revolution. At the very least, it's akin to it. When you live in interesting times, which is a Chinese curse, times of great danger and opportunity, which is also a Chinese curse, there come moments where you want to, even if you're the most ardent visionary idealist, Say, I just want a day off. Make it stop for a day. Let me just live my life for a day. 
Well, there were ways that French people who experienced the French Revolution might get some privacy from the ever hungry demands of revolutionary life, but there's precious little escape from industry. So let's look at what is going to be built in the revolution of industry, a society like no other. We start with the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, where human beings stop being nomadic hunter-gatherers, where all men hunt and all women gather, where there is precious little extra food, where the old and the sick are left as people move from camp to camp because there is not simply enough food to take care of them. The kind of society like the Eskimos had where when you are so old that you're not bringing in food, every mouthful of food that you take is taken from the mouths of your grandchildren. So in the middle of a storm, you go out and are never seen again. The lifestyles of Paleolithic hunter-gatherers is characterized by an existential anxiety of whether I'll get enough food today. Because you don't have extra food to stockpile for tomorrow, usually. So people discern what seeds are. And some desperate person, or very brave person, usually both, decided instead of wandering to follow the herds and the seasons and strip the land bare and then come back five years later to the same camp again, what we're going to do is put all of our eggs in one basket. We are going to plant these fields and we're going to spend all our time cultivating them and protecting them from harm and making sure that we grow a good harvest. And if we do that, we can have not just enough food, we can have food for the old, food for the sick, food for the king, food for the priests, food for the warriors, food for the craftsmen, food for people who are not food producers. And this lifestyle produces the world's first civilization five or 6,000 years ago in ancient Sumer in southern Iraq near the city of Basra today. You have cities first appear and these cities are places where if two, if trade broke down, most people would die. That's how you know what a city is. They are places of specialized labor, where instead of doing everything you need to survive personally, where men do everything involved with hunting and women do everything involved with gathering, instead of that, thank you, um, you do one thing, well enough to get paid. And with the pay that you earn, you buy everything you need. Civilizations have writing. They have advanced technology and they have the complex institutions of family, of law, of government, of faith, of uh, money. And from ancient Sumer through the 19th century in Britain, the agrarian lifestyle is set. And every civilization, whether it's the Aztecs and the Incas in Middle America or the Chinese along the Yellow River, the, the Huangho River, or the, the Yangtze River in India, around the Indus River or south of there, in the Middle East, or in Europe, all civilizations, without exception, bar none, follow an agrarian model of organization where 70 to 95% of your population is in the fields working, growing food. So that that 5 to 30% of non-food producers can survive. Even then, until the potato is brought from the Americas, Europeans go through two cycles of starvation every year. Before the winter harvest, a few days to a couple of weeks, and in August before the main harvest in the autumn, which can be from one to four weeks, depending upon how long the food supplies from the last harvest last. In societies 
that require 70 plus percent of their people to work in the fields just to grow enough food, there isn't much extra food beyond what everyone needs for the society to function. Think about how different these societies are. The Aztecs with their hungry gods, hungry for human hearts to go into the flames. The Chinese empire with their son of heaven and their Mandarin bureaucrats. Islam, or before it, the Persian empire with its Zoroastrian lord of light and lord of dark. Greece, Rome, Charlemagne's empire. Germany, Britain, Russia. All of these very different societies had very similar economies. It's like, it's as if the agrarian societies were all the same basic shape, a humanoid bipedal shape, but each society wore a different mask and wore different clothing. Oh yes, that mask is very stark. That clothing makes you look fat. That clothing makes you look thin. There's, there's too much revealed. There's too little revealed. But it's all on a bipedal humanoid form. It's all reflecting the agrarian society focused on farming, using muscle power. Now, this society revolves around three basic institutions, which are typically called field, throne, and altar. Most people's lives follow field, throne, and altar, because most people live in the countryside. All of this urban stuff we've talked about with the Renaissance and Paris, th those are the minority of the society's people. The majority live in the country, and they follow the rhythms of the field. There's the growing season, the I'm sorry, the planting season, the growing season, the harvesting season, the fallow season of winter. There's the winter crop, there's the summer crop. There are all the things that you need to do to keep yourself alive and grow enough extra food to make something like a profit or pay your taxes. Throne. The typical form of human government in pre-industrial times is monarchy. The typical form of government in industrial times is dictatorship of one kind or another. When I say typical, I'm not saying desirable. I'm saying usual. Human beings, for better or worse, are hierarchical creatures. We are social creatures who exist in a hierarchy. We're almost canine in this respect. And so in most societies, the most aggressive bullies become the leaders. This is why the United Nations is something I hold in absolute utter contempt. Because since the Korean War, it has been useless for everything but corruption. Why? In my judgment, and you think about this and just come to your own conclusions, you cannot have an institution that primarily represents third world dictatorships, one party states where the cruelest rule over the rest, come together in New York City as a colloquy and produce anything other than corruption. These are not governments that are legitimate in any Western sense. They don't come from an elected majority of any kind. They're not parliamentary in any way. Most of the world is run by force, by thugs, <laughs> with guns. You are so lucky. <laughs> so am I. To live in a society that actually believes there is such a thing as human rights. But the industrial age dictatorships are far worse than almost any monarchy. And here's why. Monarchy which is the most typical form of pre-industrial government, is a unity of church and state where the kingship is a holy office, where the priests say, this is the choice of the gods, this monarch, this king. He is the one who will rule over us in nominate Deus, in the name of God. So, monarchies, even in the hands of bad rulers, tend to be restrained within the traditions and mores of their religious faith. Whereas modern dictatorships can do anything. 
you have Western technology without Western values in the hands of people who don't come from a culture that earned that technology. You know what dental equipment is used for primarily in Uganda, at least during the 1970s and still today a little bit? It's not used to fix your teeth, it's used to torture. It's a torture device. Think about dental equipment in the hands of a dentist that isn't interested in helping you at all, but is simply interested in inflicting pain. Modern dictatorships have no restraint. They're Darwinian. They're atheist atheistic. They, rule, they worship power and power and power alone. But monarchies tend to be restrained within the confines of what their religion says is right and wrong. Now, some of the religions, again, the Aztecs with their human sacrifice, can be pretty dark. But once you understand the religion, you can understand what the government will and won't do. And unless you have a, an insane monarch like Gaius Caligula, you are going to, uh, or Little Bootsy as he was known, which is what Caligula means, um, for the most part, you can navigate in monarchy without too much trouble. Throne requires that you pay taxes, that you obey the law. That's basically it. Pay your taxes. Pay the law. Pay your taxes. Pay the law. You'll be left alone for the most part in a pre industrial monarchy. So, field, throne, and altar. Again, church and state tend to be a unity together, they tend to reinforce one another. The exception was the European Middle Ages, where you have, in Western Europe anyway, a separate church and state. In Eastern Europe, the Orthodox Church is beholden to the Byzantine Emperor and later to the Russian Tsar. But in the West, you have an independent papacy with an independent church, which creates a difference. You have dueling authorities, kings versus popes, popes versus kings. And like in a family where you have angry divorced parents or divorcing parents who are sniping at one another, appealing to the children to take sides, which is a terrible thing. The kids can wangle more gifts because both parents are more interested in using the children as pawns in their game than in being parents. Both church and state, though intended to function together in Western Europe, often were, were in competition. And that competition ultimately benefits the people of Europe by giving them more and more authority and autonomy. <laughs> Field, throne, and altar. And on top of everything, what would surprise you the most, I suspect, is the quietude of it all. The quietude of it all. We are surrounded by devices. <laughs> Cars, trucks, aircraft, sirens, computers and TVs and radios and various devices blathering at us 24-7, 365. Quiet, quiet, quiet typifies the pre-industrial world. Well, there were times when things were noisy, battles were very noisy. But for the most part, the pre-industrial world was a world that operated slowly by modern standards, almost sedately, very quietly, because you don't have the constant din of machinery. Please close the shades. This is captured nicely in a story of shtetl Jews, that's rural ghetto Jews, <laughs> called Federal on the Roof. It's where you see clip of now. Tevia. Oh, yeah, Tevia.